Okay, so what I'm going to do for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes is talk about dorsal root ganglion stimulation. So we're going to switch from dorsal column, or traditionally known as spinal cord stimulation, to this different form of stimulation. Um, you'll see this, this change in nomenclature, because this technically is a form of spinal cord stimulation to some degree, uh, even though the DRG just sits outside or slightly lateral to the, to the spine. Um, and then after about 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to do a wardrobe change, and I'm going to have actually Dr. Lee just talk about how she does the IPG implantation, just talk through that. And then it'll be Russian roulette as far as what we see on the cadaver. I might go sacral this year because I don't think we've done a sacral DRG simulation, just to change it up. Uh, and then I'll show you how I implant uh, on the cadaver. So... DRG stimulation, um, as I mentioned, there was the ACCURATE trial published in 2017 in pain. That was performed on patients with CRPS or causalgia of the lower extremities. And, and that was really the, the level one RCT that opened up this form of stimulation. Um, it is also used for persistent post-surgical pain syndromes. Um, so this could be after a knee arthroplasty, after a total hip, after inguinal hernia repair, uh, and even though the labeling is T10 through S2, uh, there are levels above that where I've done this for post-surgical pain syndrome, such as after mastectomy, uh, after sternotomy, uh, and even upper GI surgeries like cholecystectomies where the incisions have uh, significant pain. And then that last group is the peripheral neuropathies. As I mentioned, there was the dorsal column spinal cord stimulation paper looking at painful diabetic neuropathy. This therapy has also been utilized for not only diabetic peripheral neuropathy, but other forms of peripheral neuropathy. It's just that they don't have the studies, well, shall I say, that the strong studies to support its use. There was a case series by Dr. Anthony on peripheral neuropathy and the use of DRG stimulation, but um, would like to see better prospective study on that. So who can do this? Um, as fellows, I'm sure you have, um, raise your hand if you have access to DRG stimulation in your program. Can you learn it? Do people do it? About half. Um, so in order to do it, you have to be, uh, you have to complete 14 hours of training. That's actually an FDA, uh, mandate. And as fellows, you can of course learn from those who have already gone through that training. Uh, as I mentioned, it's T10 through S2, uh, and was approved in February, 2016. Um, so this gives you an idea of, of the different types of areas you can really focus on with DRG simulation. If you think about spinal cord or dorsal column simulation, you're talking about large swaths of body. So the entire leg, the entire back. But with DRG simulation, you can get as focused as the lateral toe, the instep, the knee. Uh, so if you want to think broadly, when do I consider spinal cord simulation or dorsal column versus dorsal root ganglion simulation, it's really about the geography of pain. So if it's larger, you're, you might be thinking more SES, and if it's more focal, uh, DRG. And, and one of the most challenging things we've encountered with spinal cord stimulation is foot pain. Uh, we've tried spinal cord stimulation thousands of times for foot pain. And what has happened historically, not always, you know, sometimes we get success, but oftentimes what happened would be the patient not only doesn't get really good benefit in their foot, but also you're stimulating parts you don't want to be stimulating, like the shin, the calf, et cetera. And the reason for that is those very distal neurons are quite deep in the spinal cord. And so in order to get your electrical stimulation to that point to get the feet, you're also stimulating other nerves before you get to that depth in the spinal cord. So that's why, in particular for feet pain, I think DRG stimulation is, is really important. So the DRG are those bulbous structures here lateral to the spinal cord. You can see the rootlets, et cetera. This cryomicrotome from Quinn Hogan out of Medical College of Wisconsin beautifully illustrates what the DRG looks like. Uh, what he did is he, he stained the epidural space in green. Uh, I used these cryomicrotomes when I was an anesthesiologist thinking about uh, epidural anatomy from C2 through L5S1, which was really helpful for me for understanding you know, how to do epidurals really well. But the same picture gives you an idea of how we actually traverse along the epidural space out to the DRG. So what we're going to be doing with this technique that I'm going to show you is entering the epidural space at a different angle than what you saw Dr. Lee do, use a sheath to traverse along that green epidural space out to the DRG, 
lay out a lead and bring the sheep back in and within that lateral epidural space create tension relief loops so that the lead doesn't move okay um, so that's why that's where the technical challenge or complexity comes in in this parasagittal cut here you can see where the drg is in the neural foramen so it's high and tight uh, and so fluoroscopically, we want our lead to be in that general vicinity because that's where the DRG is. We don't want it to be too caudal or inferior in the neural foramen. This gives you an idea of the ligaments surrounding the neural foramen. So how many of you have done a transforaminal epidural steroid injection? Everyone should be raising their hand. Okay, otherwise you're sleeping. The, the, that pop you sometimes will feel when you're doing a transforaminal. You guys ever experienced that little loss of resistance? Like, oh. Feel, you know, those are actually the ligaments. You know, your, your, your tendons are probably saying, oh, it's a bone spur or maybe some disc fragment, hopefully not. Uh, but nonetheless, that what you're feeling there are the ligaments. And the reason I, I never knew this in my tendons are always like, oh, it's a bone spur or whatever else, because we never really understood this anatomy. I never thought about neuroforaminal ligaments until we had to do this procedure. So these, these foraminal ligaments are like the strings of a tennis racket. They're, they're what are preventing you from getting in and out, and they're suspending the nerve root and the DRG in, the, in that foramen. So as we come out, what often happens is there's this resistance to bringing the sheath and lead out, and you can feel that. And guess who else feels that? The patient. Because what you're doing is now as you're trying to poke out through those ligaments, you're, you're stretching, you're pulling the nerve. You actually might be irritating the nerve. So it's a, it's a really, it's probably the trickiest part of the procedure from a surgeon to patient interaction. Because if you're doing this in a patient who has the best neurologic monitor, i.e., awake, they're gonna they're gonna feel that discomfort. So we'll we'll talk about some of the ways we can mitigate those issues. But as soon as you get that release, you're out, and you'll probably see it when we do it on fluoro. Although I'm going to do sacral DRG, in which you don't have these neural foraminal ligaments. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you see my previous videos or you do this yourself, important to understand that. And then this is just an X-ray, and, and what we're looking here on this AP or PA view is is where the DRG really sit in the green circles. Um, so just under the pedicles, uh, that's really where we want to target the lead. And you can see on the lower left here, they have the L4 and L5 DRG stimulated. As you go more caudal, the DRGs are slightly more lateral. So as you can see here, that L5 placement might look like we push the lead out too lateral. That's on purpose because that's where the DRGs are. As you head more rostral, uh, the DRGs get a little bit tighter uh, under the pedicle until you get to the cervical spine. And then hardware-wise, um, the Chewy needle is the same uh, usual Chewy needle, 14-gauge. Uh, we have two sheaths. Those are the brown lines here. There's a large curve, and then there's a shallow or small curve. Uh, most of us always use the large curve. Um, where we use the small curve is, is when there's a lot of tension getting out of the neural foramen, because with the large curve, when it hits that resistance, it, it tends to bend more rather than penetrate through. So sometimes we'll change out to the small curve. So if I struggle today, you'll probably see me switch out to that. There's a stylet. Um, which is basically the, the same thickness as a lead, but now it's got some rigidity or stiffness to it. So that can, again, be another way to help you penetrate through the neuroforaminal ligaments. Uh, and then the bottom here, some of the changes that's happened in the hardware has been because of the transitions from one company to another to another. Um, and so hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have the next generation of a sheath uh, and next generation of a lead. Uh, but for right now, these are the, the instruments that we have at our disposal. Positioning is always really important in spinal cord stimulation, but it's even more important with DRG stimulation. So when I see somebody struggle, it's often because the positioning wasn't perfect of the patient. So really important, especially as you guys start out, like right now your tendings may be doing it or the OR staff are already setting the positioning the patient really important that you guys understand the position of the patient. So what I like to see if I'm doing the procedure in the lumbar spine is a loss of that lordosis, so a near flattening of that lumbar spine to really open up that epidural space. Because if you maintain their natural lordosis in the prone position, the neural foramina might uh, compress to some degree, and you may have more difficulty getting out of the frame. And so really important you do that. There are different ways to do that, whether you use a Wilson frame, a bow frame, um, or pillows and blankets. Just really understand that anatomy, and just make sure with the pillows and blankets, they're not radio opaque. 
because you really have to have good floral anatomy for this procedure. These are some of the examples of the needle trajectories with the chewy. Um, some people even come more lateral, just depending on the level they're coming in. So what we're trying to do, I'm gonna step away from the mic, apologies to the camera, but I just wanna point out to the audience, there are two points that are really important. One point is the midline of the upper space, the And the other point is the, the pedicle itself. So if you draw those two dots from the uh, middle of the pedicle through that interlaminar space where you want your needle to enter and then draw a line, that's your trajectory. And where you start along that line depends on the BMI of the patient, frankly, or the depth to target. So if you have someone who's 400 pounds, you may be starting way out here. If you have somebody who's 80 pounds, you might be starting right here. Okay, because you want to maintain on a lateral view a 30 degree angulation to the lamina, like you would with SES. Keeping the camera guessing. Uh -huh. Yes, do Dr. You, Lee. Uh, you are doing this dance, trying to get your pubic to the epidural space right in the dead midline. Yeah. Are you uh, alternating between AP and lateral or AP and contralateral oblique? How do you do that? When yeah, I started this procedure, that was a challenge because the depth issue yeah. right in the middle of the epidural space is, is one of the harder parts. Yeah, so you absolutely can use CLO or contralateral oblique or lateral um, to really ensure, and it, and it is a little bit of a dance of going back and forth. You really do have to ensure you're within what I would say the zone of the spinous process. That's where your needle has to enter the epidural space. If you're too far ipsilateral, then you have to go over the dura and then out the foramen. So your sheath and lead are doing an S, and what you what happens there is you lose your steerability. If you're too far contralateral with your entry, you may not have enough room to work with to create the tension relief loop. So as Jen was saying, it's really important to be midline. Um, and this is another reason why this is kind of an advanced procedure because hopefully you've had spinal cord stimulation well under your belt, understand entering with the 14 gauge Tui. Here you have to enter right in that midline zone. With that said, that doesn't mean you, you guys as fellows have to learn dorsal column before you do this. I think that's totally wrong. I think you guys could jump into this and as long as you understand the game, it's totally fine. But as long as you, again, remember, you just have to enter at the midline. Otherwise, you're making your life more difficult. So this just gives you an idea of the angulation here at L4 and L5. As you can see, our, our, our um, angle off midline is increasing. So this is coming in more of like a 40-degree a angle towards the midline uh, rather than what you were seeing at the higher uh, lumbar and lower thoracic levels. All right, so here's what it looks like schematically. So I enter with the TUI, um, and then what I'm doing is I'm placing a sheet that's curved, and the needle and the sheath are married together, so that it, there's like an exaggerated curve, and then I take that out towards the foramen. Um, you'll feel that loss of resistance through the ligaments, and then once you're out, the goal is to get that uh, third contact, the so second and third contacts just underneath the pedicle. I'll check a lateral, making sure I'm still dorsal underneath the pedicle. If that all checks out, then I'll retract the sheath. And inside the lead, there's a little stylet, which I'll pull back to make it turn from more cooked spaghetti, or excuse me, raw spaghetti to cooked spaghetti, so it's got more flaccidity, if that's even a word. Um, and then uh, the way I do that is I'll unscrew and bring that sheath back slowly, as you can see here, so that brown sheath is retracting back. And then what I do is, as that sheath is retracted, I'm able to either advance lead to create that rostral loop, or I have to drive the sheath up to create that loop. And then what I'm gonna do is flip everything to the right, the needle and the sheath together in a, in a caudal direction, and I'll create that inferior caudal loop. And so what I'm creating here is this S, and what that does, in essence, is it creates a spring within the epidural space. So when the patient starts moving, the lead doesn't want to jostle out. If I just took that out and I didn't put the tension relief loops, that lead would pop out with flexion and extension of the spine. So it's really important to create those tension relief loops. And I'll go as far as to say the, the more loops you put in, the, the just think about the spring constant, the, the less likely that lead is going to move because it now will require much more energy in that spring in order for the lead to retract. So I'll put M's and W's rather than S's. So that's my, what I've adapted to doing over the years. 
Um, in our lateral view, you can see here, those leads coming out at you look like Cheerios. That's a great sign. That means those leads are coming directly out laterally. Um, so this is what you want to see uh, on slides or squares three and lat. This is, these are just some of my own pictures, kind of hard to see with the lighting here, um, but just gives you an idea of, of what it looks like in real cases. Um, this is a curved needle on the right, not a coup de, not a straight. So again, you know, just play with every type of needle you can in the next year or two so you get a good understanding. Just this was a thoracic case. Um, I think this was a case for a patient who had a chondrosarcoma of the rib resected but continued to chronic pain afterwards, off-label, uh, but nonetheless, um, really, really good outcome. And this is sacral DRG. Uh, this is a woman who had uh, vulvodynia for uh, basically her entire life, dyspareunia, hadn't had sex in 25 years, did DRG simulation of, as you can see here, S2, S3, S4, and she could have sex again, and she could, have, she could wear her underwear, uh, which she had not done. She was not wearing underwear for 20 years because it was too painful due to the allodynia. So I think I'm going to try and show you guys sacral DRG. We'll see what we see on the cadaver. They, there might not even be a sacrum. Uh, but nonetheless, if there is, uh, we'll show you how we do this, and I'll show you some of the tips and tricks here. Here's the literature. And then Jen, although she ran away, it looks like. Uh, maybe, Doug, if you want to talk a little bit about how you do implantation while I do my wardrobe change. <laughs> and then I'll show it. Thanks. So the implantation of DRG is a little bit more delicate than it is with spinal cord stimulation. The uh, quadrupolar leads are thin. They're like angel hair pasta as compared with, uh, you know, large spaghetti needles. So this is uh, done um, hooked to uh, an IPG that has four ports. Uh, it's done, you put the IPG when planning to do whatever you're doing it for. If you're putting it at, at L1 or T11, or as he just showed you, S1 and S2. I've planted uh, off labels. I do some of the pelvic pain, S1 and S3 for bladder pain and uh, problems with uh, chronic cystitis, interstitial cystitis. So this is uh, something that he'll show you. The technique is um, more difficult than spinal cord stimulation, but and I don't think it's that difficult. It's just different. And you know some of the um, off-label stuff that's really good for you showed the thoracic spine. You know, I've had people with post thoracotomy syndrome. You know, how do you handle that? post herpetic neuralgia that just is persistent, typically in the thoracic spine. Um, chronic pelvic pain. You know, one of the greatest uh, obstacles of us treating people with chronic pain. So this is really good for treating narrow parts, and it's also. Uh, Yes. Any volunteers before I volunteer Matt to go with Neil? Matt, gonna go. So he's the future fellow, not this year, but uh, the following year, two years from now. So say your condolences to him uh, here now. That is not an easy fellowship. <laughs> he's also Neil's son, so I can't be mean to him, but I've, I've got to put him through the paces come out fully featured. Um, so what I was saying is that some of the off-label cervical is also off-label. You may catch some people putting this in in cervical before, you know, narrow area pain, pain just related to a portion of the leg, a portion of the arm, um, a portion of the thoracic spine. This is an absolute game changer. 